Welcome to the ADAA Members Only Webinar. Thanks everybody for joining us. We're going to start right away. I don't want to keep you. I'm Jean kaplan Tykro. I'm the Communications Director for ADAA. And today we're going to be hearing from Anne-Marie Albano, a Prescriptive Treatment for Children and Adolescents with School Refusal Behavior. And so for those of you who may not have ever attended um, a one of our webinars, let me just tell you that we will take questions, uh, probably answer them at the end. And the way you can ask questions is you should see a little Q&A box to the right of the, of the slideshow. And uh, you can type your questions in there. And nobody can see them except uh, Dr. Albano and I. And we'll try to answer as many as we can, time permitting. Um, we're recording the webinar, and we'll make it available on the ADA website whenever I find a moment to, to post it. Easier said than done, but I will do that. Um, and so you can also spread the word for people who may have missed it or if you want to hear it again. Anyway, as I said, today we'll be hearing from Dr. Anne-Marie Albano, who is a clinical psychologist. You can see all her credentials here, Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology in Psychiatry, the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and she's the Director for the Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorders at Columbus Circle, Columbia University in the great city of New York. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Anne-Marie, you're the president of the Society of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology of the American Psychological Association. Well, I'm past president oh, of that. Past president. Yep. Okay. <laughs> or that hat. Still an yep. honor. Okay. Yeah. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Anne-Marie Albano. Thanks so much, Jean, and welcome, everybody. I see some familiar names. Um, and for those of you I don't know, and even for those of you I do, I hope uh, that at one of our ADAA meetings, the next one of which is going to be in Miami in the spring, please come up and say hello. Uh, it's a great place for us to get together and talk more one-on-one -on -one about some of the cases and share information that might be helpful to one another in working with children who have uh, a school refusal behavior. So this has been uh, near and dear to my heart for many years, especially since when I was roughly, well, just about turning 14, my parents moved us from New York City, where I had been in the same school with the same kids for eight years, some of them for nine years since kindergarten, and we moved to Florida. Uh, talk about being, like, transported to a different place and time and feeling like, a, you know, stranger in a strange land. I walked into a brand new high school for me where all the kids kind of knew each other. I knew no one besides the fact that I was wearing clothes that were very different. It was 99 degrees and 99% humidity. I was a New Yorker, so I was, like, sweating. It just was one of the most, like, horrific experiences and every bit of social anxiety that an adolescent has just naturally at that time was so manifest in me. Um, so my thing was I begged my parents to send me back to New York City and put me in an orphanage that was on Staten Island. They didn't do that, um, but I certainly struggled with school refusal for a little bit until it self-corrected as I settled in. Um, and that's the thing. Uh, transient pleas of school, for school refusal, you know, let me stay home, I don't want to go. This happens for various reasons, one being kids moving to a new school. Um, and the thing that happens, you know, this isn't uncommon after a child's been ill, after holidays, if there's something that's gone on at school that's causing some stress for the child with other peers, let's say, or evaluations or something, you know, that occurs. But typically what happens and what happened to me is as the child gets used to the situation and also they get involved more and focused on things going on at school, it becomes much more reinforcing, and that in and of itself helps the child self-correct and move on. A lot of positive reinforcement is delivered during the course of a school day. And Marie, can but, I stop you for a moment? I'm sorry. Yep. Um, if I haven't told you already, if you uh, somebody said they're having trouble with the audio, if you haven't muted the speaker on your computer, um, I think, okay, maybe now it's better. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Is this happening yeah. with me? I'm not sure what I the think speaker is. 
I think it's better. I, I oh, actually, I did have them muted, so okay. Okay, so it was right. me. Okay, I apologize. Thank you very <laughs> All much. All right. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So um, when we do talk, though, about what is school refusal behavior, we look at it in terms of a continuum, a continuum of, you know, complaints that parents will talk about happening with some regularity um, Sunday afternoon into Sunday evening, mornings before school. They can predict these happening after a vacation and such. And there's oftentimes um, some calling home during the school day, leaving class to go and stay in the nurse's station, things like that. Um, we put these on a continuum from the mild all the way to missing more class time to staying out of school and having complete absence. So there's a range of the way these behaviors are manifest at home, on the way to school, uh, you know, arguing in the car, not wanting to get on the school bus, let's say, um, clinging to the parents in front of the school, not leaving their side, all the way to then leaving the class, refusing to go in the class, and then not going to school at all. Now, the scope of this problem, uh, we are talking here today about school refusal that is due to anxiety or depression. And so we're not focusing on kids who have conduct disorder or oppositional defiant problems. Those kids are refusing school in a different way. They're, they're related to truancy. And I'm also not talking about children who, are, uh, who have school withdrawal. And that's not that the children have it. What school withdrawal is, is where the child is, is kept at home for a purpose. And a lot of times that purpose is serving some function in the family, taking care of other children, watching children while the parents are working, or if there's a parent with psychopathology of some sort, they're staying home because of that, taking care of the parent or the other kids who might be in the house. That's a different situation. But about 5 to 10% of children in, we'll say, 6 to 18 years of age refuse school at some point in time. They refuse to attend because of anxiety or depressive concerns. We typically see this happening equally in boys and girls and it crosses the various socioeconomic levels. So it's not um, related to any particular SES group, although you tend to see it clustering more in urban areas and having more school refusal cases there than in more rural areas. Most kids who refuse are the middle school age, although we see very young children when they're starting school, five, six, seven, and even we get a lot of referrals for preschool refusers. And then we also see a fair number of the adolescents with various things going on at that point in time, especially around evaluation periods or, you know, getting uh, into new schools when they're switching into high school or something. All right. Um, we look at school refusal differently than in the past. I mean, if we were doing this talk and it was 1965, let's say, we'd be talking about school phobia. But school phobia is really, uh, it's, it doesn't capture what's actually going on. And school phobia, that term, makes you think that the child's afraid of something about the school or something to do with school, that it's all based on fear of something. And in fact, Chris Carney has studied and really devoted his career to study in school refuse be, refusal behavior. And he found with Wendy Silverman and others who have worked with him that school refusal, when it's due to anxiety or depression, is really mediated by four functions, or there's four things that the school refusal behavior serves. And one is that, function one is kids who avoid school because it brings up negative affect to bring in there, to be in school. And we'll talk about that, but these are youth primarily with various anxieties or depression. They don't feel good in school, hence when they're at home they feel better. The second function is escaping social or evaluative situations. And here's where you have socially anxious kids, test anxious kids. Um, they don't feel good in school because of the way that they feel the, they may, will be the focus of attention, they'll be negatively evaluated, they'll be made fun of, rejected. They feel better at home because they're away from those anxiety-producing situations. The, now, those are negative reinforcement 
uh, paradigms, and we'll talk about that in a second. But it, when you stay home, you feel better. That reinforces your staying home. The third function is children who get a lot of attention for their complaints, their crying, their tantrums, their attempts to run away or hide under the bed. When I say run away, it's not running far because these kids are largely separation anxious. And the more they act up, the more their parents swoop in, stay with them, try to calm them, engage them then in arguing or whatever it is, but they keep the parents' attention. That's a positive reinforcement paradigm. I act up, I get attention from mom. And the fourth one then is kids who they may have initially had anxiety in various forms, whether it's panic or had depression, or they may initially had been separation anxious, but now they're at home, and usually they're at home for such a period of time that they don't get up until they want to, they have free access to the refrigerator or whatever, they're not having to turn in work at school the way they would if they were attending, so a much reduced schedule of uh, things that they are responsible for. They get a lot of positive, tangible reinforcement for staying out of school. And these are the ones where, you know, they, are, they have access to the computer, they might be on games, they might even see friends after school hours and weekends, but they're not going to school because it's, you know, they've lost the reason why they initially stopped, but now the refusal is maintained by hanging out at home. So let's go through these reasons um, and see what's going on here. In function number one, escaping bad feelings, uh, these kids could have worry, and this is where children who are worried about what's going to come next in school, am I going to make it to the next grade and achieve what I need to achieve, um, they might be worried about things in their, uh, you know, that's going on in family. Uh, if mom is ill or dad is ill, how are they? If I'm sitting here, what if they need me? Not in a separation anxious sense, but in the worry sense, uncontrollable worry. These kids could be perfectionistic, and it's more upsetting to be in school and working when they can't do it the way they want to or at their time or do it as, as perfectly as they want. There's a lot of things that go along with generalized anxiety disorder, but they're very much worried and caught up with worry during the day while they're at school. The other anxieties that you see at this time, uh, especially with teenagers, this is where panic disorder starts to take hold. And so kids who are having panic attacks and their concern is that if they have an attack, it'll be noticed, something bad will happen from it, that is, they faint, or they, they're overcome with whatever the experience of panic means to them, they feel they're better at home where they can be taken care of or feel safe. It's classic panic, and the school refusal is a form of agoraphobia, not wanting to be in a situation where panic might overwhelm them. We do also see kids with phobic disorders. They are, and these are the kids that might have been called school phobic, but they're afraid more of riding the bus, or the transportation that gets them to school. I worked with children when I was in Kentucky who were afraid to be in school in case a uh, tornado happened and they didn't want to be away from home if that was to happen. So there could be phobic situations that cause the school refusal. And we've had some children we've worked with, especially little ones, who get afraid of the fire alarm when they have a fire drill, things like that. And so a phobic type of situation might be contributing to their school, uh, their anxiety about going. We also then see post-traumatic stress um, as another reason why kids might refuse. And this, of course, you know, depending upon what the um, situation was that uh, that put the PTSD in place, whether it was something that's at home abuse or uh, neglect of some sort, or whether it was something like. I've treated kids with PTSD from motor vehicle accidents who then did not want to be transported anywhere, including school. So you have to look at what was the traumatic experience um, and, and work with that, but, that's a, but school refusal becomes a reason then that they stay home and feel better and more safe in some way, depending upon what the situation was. And we'll also see then the depressive disorders, including you know kids with major depression or dysthymia they don't feel good in school. Looking around them, their friends are having fun, teasing one another, the friends are responding to things. These kids are having a tough enough time concentrating because of the depression. 
they've lost interest in things that bring them pleasure, they don't feel accomplished at much of anything, school reminds them of how miserable they feel. So the children who have these kinds of conditions, staying home reinforces the feeling of relief from the anxiety or depression. They can bunker into their room, stay away from things, and that keeps the events and the withdrawal from school going. So it's a negative reinforcement paradigm there. The second thing then is, are the children who have social anxiety, uh, social phobia, and they don't like to go to school because, again, who's making plans to get together for the weekend, who's being called on to give an oral report, answering questions, various things like that occur, and to them this is overwhelming. And many of the kids that I work with who have social anxiety disorder and school refusal, they talk about when they were younger in school and felt this way, for some reason they felt they could hide a little more easily or the, uh, behind the kid in front of them, so they pick seats towards the back of the class if they can. They don't go to things that are extracurricular, so they just go to school then go home. Um, they sit and they spend their um, free time either in the classroom or, or someplace where the other kids are not around, like the library or such. But when they advance towards adolescence and there's many more demands to work in groups with other kids, collaborative uh, work and learning, things like that, they get so much more overwhelmed and they want to leave. And so again, staying home takes them out of the social spotlight or the evaluative spotlight of others, their friends and their teachers looking at them, and that reinforces the escape and, and the school refusal. And this negative reinforcement paradigm, I borrowed this from Tamar Chansky, um, but this is a great illustration of what happens. The anxiety in, the, in this first, I don't know if you could see my pointer, but the anxiety in the first um, graph shows how it builds as time goes on. And if the child you know, is feeling anxious in class and then they leave, go to the nurse's office, I want to call my mother, I don't feel well, and they're allowed then to either lay down in the nurse's office and then eventually this moves to leave and the mom picks them up and then it moves to staying home, not even going in, what happens is you get immediate relief when you are able to escape or avoid a situation. And the child then remembers the situation at the height of their fear. This means they're constantly associating, right, that the situation is so anxious, but as soon as I'm out of it, I feel better. It reinforces the shape, and it does not allow the child to work through what it is they're concerned with. Okay, you got asked a question in class. You didn't quite know the answer. The teacher moved on to someone else. And how you feel, you know, anxious for a little bit, but it goes away, and you also get to see other kids might not know the answer, and it moves on, and you feel better. They don't get to do that if they escape. So similarly, if, uh, you know, if this is on and on and they're escaping more and more, it solidifies that escape behavior. Well, if what we could do is keep the kids in school and teach the parents how to keep them going to school, right, then what happens is they get exposed to the situations they're afraid of again and again. And the more that they get exposed to dealing with the situations they're afraid of and being in them, then they remember, they habituate to the anxiety, they learn anxiety passes on its own, and also they learn how to struggle with a situation and problem solve and so forth, and they feel a bit of mastery. But what starts the anxiety disorder and what starts then the school refusal is being allowed to escape, and then what we're going to see is what overcomes it is putting the kids in the situation so they work it through, all right? The next two functions are all positive reinforcement. Attention-seeking behavior is driven by this separation anxiety disorder. I have a case that I've written about and uh, I talk about a lot. It always sticks in my mind of a little girl. She was about, I think, 12-year-old girl <laughs> who uh, was school refusing, um, and her mother went to her own therapist complaining of the school refusal, and the mother's therapist said to her, it's obvious your child is, is making a cry for help. She wants to spend more time with you, so why don't you do things like take her to lunch, go to the museum, blah, blah, blah. Oh, my goodness. 
this is a perfect example of how positive reinforcement uh, you know, gets in there and solidifies a school refusal behavior and separation anxiety. It's actually the opposite of what we want to do. We don't want to give positive attention to anything that's going to keep school refusal going. Um, so that's, you know, a positive reinforcement um, sort of um, paradigm gets set up when kids with separation anxiety are constantly seeking attention, crying, and complaining because it keeps the parents locked in. And then gaining positive tangible reinforcement, this is where we've had so many parents just throw their hands up. And, you know, as we can imagine, whether it's uh, both parents at home or both parents working, rather, single parent families, whatever it is, more children in the house, it's very disruptive to have a child that is doing all kinds of acting out, especially the older they get. And so a lot of times the parents uh, sort of throw their hands up and they, they're contending with the other children or they have to go to work and things. And they're trying to work through the school system with tutoring or what have you for this for the child who's school refusing, but for the most part, they're, they're getting to stay at home and they're not getting the full school experience, they're not getting all the responsibilities and meeting those, and so a lot of benefit in their mind of just staying home happens uh, through that paradigm. So we have to work with that. So the question is, what do we do? Now what was great about Chris Carney and Wendy Silverman and, and their colleagues is they started in the 90s working on this and they developed uh, Chris you know, really moved along with the prescriptive treatment approach, that we can't do a one-size-fits-all because there are these four different reasons why kids will refuse school, and sometimes one or more sort of coalesce with one another. So we have to first understand what is driving the school refusal behavior, what's the function of staying out of school, what function does it serve the child and their condition, and then apply a, 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 tre a treatment approach that's been found to work best for that function. So one of the things that we always start out is a comprehensive assessment. We do a diagnostic interview. Um, this is shameless on my part. Yes, it's our interview. Wendy Silverman and I developed the ATIS. But we'll do some sort of diagnostic interview, and we have within it a school refusal assessment to try and figure out what's motivating the school refusal, um, but then also what's it like during the day when the child is home um, and what happens, you know, that is helping to maintain it. Now, I'm sorry I don't have a slide about this, but Chris Carney also has the school refusal assessment scale. And this is a paper and pencil measure. Uh, the child fills it out, mother fills it out, father fills it out, and it actually assesses and tells you what functions of school refusal from each of their perspective is in play. And then that way, between your diagnostic eval and then your school refusal assessment scale, you can put together a hierarchy of situations that are contributing to or need to be addressed in order to get the ch child back in. And especially with the school refusal assessment scale, you're going to see which function needs to be addressed clinically through what kind of methods uh, that have been found to be helpful for them. So this is a typical school attendance hierarchy. Uh, we have the children rate these situations. We usually have 10. I just collapsed it a little for this. But we have 10 situations on the hierarchy. Um, and the child and the parent gives their rating every time we see them from 0 to 10 uh, as to how upsetting um, this situation, these situations would be. So everything from talking to the teacher on the phone, visiting the teacher at school in the afternoon, spending 30 minutes in class, you could see how more school involvement uh, causes more anxiety for this child. What will happen is these will become our goals for treatment. We'll be working step by step with each of these targets to change the child's uh, attendance, but also you know, decrease the anxiety um, and avoidance that goes on for each situation. Now, the very first thing we do with all of our school refusers, doesn't matter what function, is get them on a regular school day routine. And that means if they're staying at home, it doesn't matter. You're getting up at whatever time you would need to get up if you were going to school. And you're going to be doing the things that you should be doing as if you were in school. So getting up out of bed, doing your washing and dressing, have breakfast, and then do the final preparations for school, including put your backpack together, um, and either you're going to school with your parents and getting in there, 
or you're going to the kitchen or dining room table if it's a child who's at home, and you're going to be working there through the day. And there's not going to be interaction by grandma, mom, whoever's home. No. In fact, the thing that we're going to be doing as we move along is we're going to be moving the child eventually out of the house if they're getting home tutoring um, or if they're not getting tutoring but just, you know, just saying we're going to move them out of the house to a library or in many cases we might even move them to the parent's workplace to sit at a table somewhere in the back of uh, the parent's office or, you know, wherever they're working and do schoolwork. If they're at home, they've got to do boring tasks. Um, and school or academic tasks. Um, the child, if the parent has to work, can be brought to another adult uh, to, be, to stay with them, but it can't be someone who's going to give them a lot of attention. It's someone who's really going to be like a hall monitor and just make sure that they don't go back into their bedroom and they don't lay down and take, you know, just go to sleep in front of the TV. They are being supervised to do work. The point being that they're, we're not, we don't want home to be fun, all right? And what happens is we ask the child every hour, would you like to go to school now? This is what the parent or whoever the caretaker is is taught to do. So a daytime routine, no matter how old they are, and yes, depending upon the age and the level of oppositionality, we have had parents put locks on the child's bedroom door so they can't get in there. We, we do take away the computer and make them work um, paper and pencil if the computer is a source of distraction. So these things have to be worked with, all right? Um, we hold tutoring sessions at local libraries or places outside of the home. Um, we don't want the kids just to be laying around or to have access to the things that would bring them, you know, more pleasure as opposed to pleasant academic activities. The second thing you have to do is get the parents in the schools cooperating. Now, of course, this is more for kids who are having um, a, a school refusal where they've been out of school, the school's concerned, the school and the parents have been talking. Now, the thing about it is you wind up being more of a mediator here, depending upon the level of um, battle that's happening. Sometimes uh, the parents will come in saying, the school put my kid in the wrong class. We begged them not to separate him from his friend. There's this, and they're blaming the school for this. The school then is blaming the parents for, you know, they're baby babying him, blah, blah, blah. You, um, as the therapist, have to put them together to say, look, let's, like, forget the pointing fingers and let's just sit here. We all have the same goals. You all have the same goals, which is to get the child back to school comfortably so let's start working towards that, those goals and what's feasible and realistic. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about that in a sec. If you have questions, please start posting them. But this, you know, establish a school routine um, and starting to get the school and the parents to work together, this is key. And then what we're doing is based on what the child's main issues are, we're prescribing a certain treatment. Now, when it's a negative affect like generalized anxiety, um, depression, phobia, panic, dysthymia, things like that, we're going to do a couple of things. First of all, everybody gets psychoeducation. What is going on, the anxiety or depression, defining it, describing it, what keeps it going. And of course, in depression, we're talking about withdrawing from activities that bring you pleasure. Much like with anxiety, you're escaping things that bring you, you know, that make you anxious, and so you feel relief, but you're not addressing your life in a, in a way. So we're, we're helping to educate them and also educating the way that maybe parents inadvertently are involved in some of this. I do psychoeducation with parents and the kids together. Then we start working more with the kids on, first of all, managing unpleasant symptoms, whether it's uh, anxiety symptoms or whether it's sleeplessness or concentration difficulties, restlessness, whatever may be associated with the depression. We're going to teach them some breathing retraining, muscle relaxation skills, mindfulness, things to help them learn how to soothe themselves, right? And what we're going to go to is then graduated exposure to the situations they find uncomfortable. 
And this is the same with behavioral activation for things that make them feel sad or the things that they feel they're not interested in. We're going to put things on a hierarchy and then move them into these situations, teaching them some problem solving on how to get into the situation and manage them. But it's a step-by-step -step thing which will involve immediately getting them doing the schoolwork they're behind on, and then also getting them to interact with the teachers and with peers and so forth. The goal is that they're going to be developing more of a sense of self-reinforcement and feel better about themselves as they start um, addressing this and correcting the things that they've been overwhelmed with in school and moving forward rather than staying home and letting more pile up on them. In terms of social anxiety, again we do psychoed and I again do it with the parents and the kids together. Here we do a lot of self-coaching on addressing the negative thoughts about I'm not good enough, I'm not as smart as everybody else, I can't handle this, the teacher thinks I'm dumb. We do a lot of role playing in um, dealing with social situations and again a graduated exposure paradigm where we're sending the kids into things in school or with peers or teachers that they've been afraid to do. It could be talking to a teacher to ask for extra help or to question a way she graded your paper. It could be going uh, in, up to some kids in the cafeteria and asking to sit down. Whatever the tasks are, we're putting them on a hierarchy, role-playing them, and then having them do those tasks. For some kids, we need to do social skill training. And these may be kids who have been so anxious, uh, socially anxious, that their skills either never developed or they developed in a rusty way. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, problem-solving skills training because they're managing different things at once. Multitasking is big. Social anxiety, they get overwhelmed. But we're going there with that. And then we call this building a coping template. We try to work out with the kids um, thinking about social and evaluative situations that are going to be coming up and planning for how to manage that. That's your coping template. For attention-seeking school refusal behavior, now let's, let's bear in mind those first two, while I did psychoed with the parents and the kids together, those were mainly child-focused. We were focused on teaching skills to the kids, whether it's behavioral activation, mood monitoring if, you know, for depression, um, problem solving and exposure for the anxiety. What we're doing now for attention-seeking school refusal is involving the parents more heavily. And here is because the anxiety, definitely we want to teach that child uh, with separation anxiety how to manage their anxiety doing some of the same things with um, self-soothing, with breathing retraining. We also want a hierarchy of situations where they're separating more and more from their parents, but we also have to disengage the parents from the overprotection and the coddling that in invariably occurs with separation anxiety. So what happens is the parents have to set up po uh, consequences for positive school behavior and school attendance, and negative consequences, which is oftentimes um, removal of privileges um, and things like that for school refusal. There's been plenty of cases where um, the kids stay at home all day with mom and dad or whoever's home, and then in the afternoon when school's done, their friends come over to play with them. Well, and they enjoy that. It's at their house. That reinforces separation anxiety, too, because everybody's coming to meet. We have to make it where if you go to school or you in interact and do things for school, you'll see your friends at the park, at somebody else's house, you know, and mom will be there for a bit, but then we're going to work on her separating from that because we want to address the separation anxiety plus the school issue. Um, we do forced school attendance with kids who are 10 or under, and uh, when there are two adults to help transport the child to school, and the school is ready to receive that child to help the child uh, calm down in the school as the parents leave. That's always a question I get, and that, that happens in, in certain cases. But the family has to be behind it, and so does the, the teachers, um, and it's got to be. It doesn't, we don't want it to overwhelm the child, but we want it to be more of a show of you've got to do this. The number one principle we have to teach parents is the PREMAC principle, otherwise known as grandma's rule. You can't get your ice cream until you finish your spinach. If you don't go to school, there's no access to computers, Game Boy, Facebook, whatever it might be. 
that's you you meet your responsibility of going to school and then you get your privileges and this is like so key to overcoming any of these conditions potential problems for working with these things of course are single parent families when one parent might be a bit overwhelmed because if there's you know if they have other things of course to deal with and so you have to work out a problem solving plan with that parent or um, you know on how to get help from other support um, adults whether it's friends or other family members. School refusal does tend to be contagious. And where I, you know, I have a famous case I worked with where a young man re refused school all through high school. Um, and then his sister, who was um, about five years younger than him, wound up seeing this. And, and lo and behold, when she was in high school, they found out that she actually had been hiding in a closet in the family home for weeks on end, hadn't gone to school. So what you have to watch if there's several children in the house refusing, especially at once, this complicates the problem and you have overwhelmed parents for dealing with dealing with this. We have to get um, the parents to respond consistently. Consistently, meaning both of them have to be on the same page if it's a two-parent family, um, on how to respond, and they have to respond consistently across different behaviors that your child exhibits reinforcing the positive and ignoring or using negative consequences for the negative, okay? Um, other problems are parents like just letting things go unless the problem is severe, they won't respond, that has to change. And they can't, you know, once things are resolved, they can't then, then go back to old patterns, right? So all of this has to be addressed in good family and parent uh, communication, problem solving, um, and teaching them good parenting practices. Um, I, I talked about this, but, you know, again, it's if kids are missing more school days than not, both parents or uh, a parent and adult can help. This is, you know, the guidelines for forced school attendance. And then when it comes to school refusal motivated by the kids who just, you know, it is great to stay at home, and boy, I, I wish I could do that. Um, this is where we work really hard on in a family, it's more like a family behavioral therapy paradigm. Um, setting up times and places for negotiating, teaching them how to negotiate and problem solve, making behavioral contracts, how to stick to and, and make consequences be realistic and things they could follow through on, but mainly trying to make it very positive reinforcement. You will earn this if you do that. There needs to be a lot of communication skills and also peer refusal skills training, because some of these kids then get very comfortable um, and maybe online all the time and getting into chat rooms and, you know, and things like that that aren't helpful to them. They have to learn how to turn those things off, say no to friends in that way, and get more into the real world, and parents have to help shape that for them. Oh, this is bad. This is like self-promotion. Um, I guess I've talked very fast, but we do have uh, – a couple of um, workbooks, one for the parents, one for the therapist, that puts this whole program together. Um, I'll take questions now uh, then that we can answer in the next uh, couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah, we've got some time. Um, I, here's one. How do you handle children who struggle to get up on their own after trying alarms, et cetera, or with prompts from parents? This may occur more with oppositional children. Do you ever have parents call the police? Well, that's, that's actually a very good question. Um, and so one of the things that I would do is, first of all, take a good look at what all is going on. What time is the child getting to bed at night? And it's not just a matter of getting to bed at a, good, a decent hour, but are they getting restful sleep? So watch the caffeine intake, uh, you know, from sodas. Are they turning off electronics and then doing a soothing routine to get to sleep? Um, are TVs and screens off in the bedroom? So what are their sleep hygiene habits? Because a lot of time getting up in the morning is because they haven't been able to sleep well at night. So that's the first thing I would work on with the parents and the kids. Um, also around those lines, you've got to look at are they on medication? And do, will the, are these medications that they're taking – um, making it harder for them to get up in the morning. And I would work with the, the psychiatrist uh, who's working with the child on that because they could maybe switch when they're taking the medicines or what or deal with that in some way. If it is driven by more oppositionality, 
Um, then, you know, the things that we do is, again, looking at the size of the child and such. Again, having the parents uh, wake them up, but you're going to be more going towards what are the things that you take away or you only make available if you've gotten up and gotten out on time. Uh, we have gone to calling um, uh, the truant officers or the police when there has been physical aggression or when um, parents have had a hard time engaging the child in getting up on their own and there's been more of a physical confrontation. Uh, so, so we have done that. And um, parents, we have had parents here um, that we've worked with, I've had for many years, who, you know, it's a rare, it's a small group, but they have to get um, sometimes court involvement. There's something in New York called the PINs, person in need of supervision petition. But, you know, the thing that we work with with the parents more is, okay, and with the kids, what's getting in the way of this? What drives the additional behavior? And if it isn't something that can be managed at home, you do have to talk with parents about more residential treatment for kids who are that oppositional. Okay, here's a good question. What do you think of inpatient school refusal programs? Well, let me, let me say, I, I have to say that I, I often work with our parents around this issue that you, you only have to the age of 18, really where you have the, you know, after 18, the kids are making their own decisions, and the first decision a lot of them unfortunately make is not to seek therapy for help um, on things that are, you know, really upsetting to them. So um, if a child has been really missing a significant portion of school, when I say significant, uh, I'm talking about closing in on a full school year. And you've tried, the parents have tried and the therapists have worked to try to get the child in school, get them back to school, um, you know, and, and the school is working with you that they're cutting down on what's expected to catch up and so on and so forth. You do need to look at a, uh, a good, supportive, anxiety-focused cognitive behavioral inpatient program or residential program. Um, and, and there are some very good ones that um, we can look at through the ADAA, and, and uh, we have some lists of them. But I, I go to a couple of them from Rogers Memorial to, um, I think it's Mountain Valley up in um, the Northeast to serve our families in this area. It's, it's better, I think, for parents to have that help earlier, so 8th or ninth grade, 7th, 8th, ninth grade, then later because it gets tougher and, and a lot of times as the therapists on this call know, we start talking about the older the child gets, not just the anxiety and mood disorders, but you get some personality, character, logical issues coming on. And that's harder to address. So the more intensive, I think, and invasive treatment in that way might be better earlier in adolescence than later. Okay, here's another question. For younger children, do you use behavior charts or other token reward systems to reinforce school attendance, uh, completing items on the school attendance hierarchy? Absolutely. We do celebrations of all kinds. Um, you know, now here's the, you know, the thing that we don't want to be buying things, so it's not around that. The, the, we use behavior charts where the child then is getting um, checks or stickers, depending on their age, or keeping track of what they're doing, so that they're earning uh, certain kinds of privileges or even attention. So, um, you know, making cookies or a cake with mom, uh, you know, something that they wouldn't do otherwise. Um, they get to pick the family outing on the weekend where it's something the parents might be picking otherwise giving them a sense of um, feeling accomplished um, and making it things that are more social, appropriately uh, interacting with the parents and trying to get them to feel good about themselves, all moving towards teaching them more self, um, feelings of self-satisfaction so that that becomes the motivator to move forward. But absolutely, especially with younger children, we'll start early with these kinds of charts and such. And it's also when we have very young children, and, and I'm talking five, six, seven years of age, 
we do our version of parent-child interaction therapy even. Uh, we call it the CALM program, Coaching Approach Behavior and Leading Through Modeling, where we're teaching the parents how to do these reinforcement strategies to shape the child's behavior. Um, and again, it's, it's all following very good behavioral principles of using small um, rewards that the child feels good about and working them towards feeling good on their own for accomplishing the behavior. Okay. I'm going to make a little shameless self-promotion here for our conference, and if we don't have any more questions, let me thank everybody for tuning in, and um, I apologize for the technical difficulties over which I had no control, but I'm glad we got them back. And um, stay tuned for more of these, and thanks again. Thank you all.